Hey everyone, this is part one of two of a speedrunner's guide to end fights, specifically for Minecraft Java version 1.16 solo runs, although many of the concepts here apply to other versions and categories. Part one is going to go over mainly dragon mechanics, while part two will cover different end fight strategies and their statistics. If you're an experienced runner, I would still suggest you watch part one, as there are a lot of mechanics that even top runners don't quite understand, and knowing these concepts will help you in your end fights. I'd like to start off by showing you the very end of this guide, the graphic we're working towards understanding. Using a combination of models and in-game testing, this graph shows the statistics of different end fight strategies in terms of the total time of the end fight, and is the main point of this guide. I hope to cover all end fight mechanics in part one so that we can then go on to understand how those are implemented in the different strategies available currently in part two. Now these curves were made using my end fight data, obviously they'll be a bit different based on the runner, but my goal is to convey that no single end fight strategy today is simply considered the best in every scenario. Currently there is no end fight strategy developed that is 100% reliable and faster than every other strategy's best time. So until then, it's important for speedrunners to be well versed in multiple strategies and know which one to use given the situation. Before starting, I want to give a huge thanks to Jojo, Matthew Bolin, LSD Gaga, and Ninja Brain. They helped explain a lot of these things and pretty much all of the smart stuff in here was initially found by one of them. I just felt like putting it all in one place. So first things first, let's talk about the end dimension. When a player enters the end, a 5x5 platform made of obsidian spawns around the coordinates 148-0 and removes any blocks up to three blocks above the platform. The main end island is made entirely of endstone with fairly random looking terrain and a center perch made of bedrock spawns at 0 0 Ten obsidian pillars spawn in a circle around the island, all with an end crystal sitting on top. There are ten different preset pillars with set widths and heights, two of which have iron bars protecting the crystal. So every end will have the same 10 pillars, just in random order. Endermen are the only mobs that naturally spawn, and their spawning mechanics are similar to mobs in the overworld. So unlike endermen that spawn in a warped forest biome that have limited spawning due to a charge-based spawn system, endermen in the end will fill up the mob cap to 70, allowing for ideas like pre-1.9 towers to manipulate mob spawning proximity. But that's a topic for another day. The Ender Dragon has 200 health, and always has an active hitbox that deals 3.5 to 6 damage on easy to the player, depending on which hitbox the player comes in contact with. The Dragon has a ranged Dragon's Breath attack, which deals 6 damage on easy roughly every second. The Dragon takes full damage when damaged via the head hitbox, and roughly one quarter damage when attacked via any of the body hitboxes. The Dragon will link with any end crystal within 32 blocks and heal 2 health per second. While linked, if the crystal is destroyed, the dragon will take 10 damage plus any damage from the crystal explosion if in range. Players purling into crystals will only take the pearl landing damage and not the explosion damage. And because the player explosion damage is calculated at the player's lower half, it is fairly easy for the player to destroy a crystal from melee range, only taking one damage. Also, the dragon is really loud. Ranking in is one of the loudest sounds known to man. Like, why? <laughs> so, that's all the easy stuff. Now we can move on to the dragon behavior. There's a ton of randomness added to the dragon's movement to make it feel like an unpredictable end fight. But when boiled down to its most basic elements, the randomness of the dragon's behavior is dictated by 24 nodes, 3 phases, and 2 graphs. And we'll go through those now. Thanks again to Matthew Bolin for pouring through the game's code and developing the dragon fight visualizer. It's much easier to understand things when we can physically see them. A link to that visualizer mod is in the description. There are 24 nodes on the end island indicated by gray outlines. In a real run, these are invisible to the player. There are 12 outer, 8 middle, and 4 inner nodes. All that we mean by node is a specific air block the game has determined will dictate most of the dragon's motion. There are a preset list of these X and Z block positions for the nodes, and the Y height of the nodes are roughly 15 blocks above the highest solid block below it. Two of these X and Z coordinates intersect with the obsidian pillars, specifically the east and west middle nodes, meaning these two node heights are much higher than the others. The dragon is very simply designed to only ever travel towards a target block, satisfy a condition, and then leave. Target blocks can be created either by the player, at the center perch, or a node. We'll talk about the player and the perch later, but most of the dragon's flight is made up from the game choosing a string of notes, 
and then creating a target block above each one of these nodes for the dragon to reach. The current string of nodes is highlighted by the mod, and the target block is shown in orange. The target blocks are chosen to be directly on the node or up to 20 blocks higher, with all positions in between being equally likely. This creates the appearance of randomness, as occasionally the dragon will need to spiral up or down to reach a target block. Once the dragon gets within 10 blocks of a target block, that condition is satisfied and the dragon moves on. The dragon can exist in multiple phases. We'll group some of them together to simplify and say the dragon has three main phases, normal, strafe, and perch. The visualizer mod shows the dragon being in normal phase when the string of nodes it needs to satisfy are colored white. When entering the end dimension, a new ender dragon is spawned high above directly over the center perch at 01280. It spends its first 20 to 30 seconds in normal phase attempting to get to its first node. The dragon will either be considered a front dragon or a back dragon depending on which east-west pillar is tallest. The player spawns on the east side of the end island, so in this case, because the east pillar is taller, we have a front dragon. This is an aerial view of the end island, where the bottom of this image is the east side where the player would spawn. If the east pillar is taller, this would give us a front dragon. There are only two nodes the dragon can initially choose to travel to. Seven eighths of the time, the dragon will choose the front right diagonal node, and only one eighth of the time, it will choose the front inner node. Alternatively, if the west pillar is taller and we see a back dragon, the dragon's choice of nodes is mirrored. And again, seven eighths of the time, we would see a back left dragon, and only one eighth of the time, the back inner node would be selected as the initial node. So that's helpful information to know, but the main point is that the dragon will always start off in normal phase, and depending on the random height chosen for its first target block, will spend about 25 seconds in this phase before moving on. Most of the dragon's time after this point is still spent in normal phase, where the dragon typically chooses a short string of outer nodes or a long string of four or so inner nodes to fly around the middle. The next dragon phase we can go over is the strafe phase. The mod shows when the dragon is in a stray phase when its path is highlighted in red. Stray phase can occur in two ways, either randomly at the end of every string of nodes, or if the dragon is in a normal phase, it will be forced into strafing if an end crystal is destroyed. Typically this is done via punching or bow and arrow, but even if a crystal is destroyed via non-player damage, the dragon will still attempt a strafe. The strafe is a fairly simple mechanic. The dragon initially creates a string of nodes leading towards the player's current position. If the dragon's head ever gains line of sight of the player, it will launch a fireball and create a new string of nodes as it's leaving. For line of sight, the player needs to be within 15 degrees in either direction from the dragon's head within 150 blocks and also have an unobstructed view in a direct line to the dragon's head. If the dragon does not gain line of sight to the player during a stray phase, it will continue flying towards the player and spiral downwards or upwards, attempting to get to a target block that is positioned at the player's lower half. Once it gets within 10 blocks, the dragon creates a new string of nodes leading away from the player, but stays in strafe mode and will return eventually to repeat the process. The dragon will only ever end its stray phase if it fireballs the player or dies. I should mention now the fireball also has an interesting mechanic where the lingering hitbox will snap to the player's feet if landing on the player's hitbox. This means that if you jump to try to avoid the projectile and it hits midair, the hitbox will be positioned at the player's head and you'll need two blocks to avoid it, whereas if you let the projectile land first and then jump, you only need one block. And now it's the moment you've all been waiting for, it's time for perch phase. Perch phase is of course traditionally the most important, as the dragon slowly approaches a consistent low to the ground position, allowing the player to deal consistent damage and beat the game. The dragon only initiates the perch on a random roll determined at the end of a path of nodes, and tends to perch more frequently the more end crystals are destroyed, but we'll get to that graph in a bit. Once the dragon decides to initiate a perch, it begins with what's called perch approach. The dragon searches for the nearest player, divides the end up into eight sections, determines which section the player is in, and creates a string of nodes leading to the perch node in the section opposite the player. Now I'll be honest, I don't know the exact shape or dimensions of these eight sections, but they look something like this. More importantly though, is that not all sections give perch approaches that take the same amount of time. If you remember the introduction to the 24 nodes, almost all of them are positioned over the end stone of the end island except for two. 
The east-west pillar nodes X and Z coordinates happen to intersect with the east-west obsidian pillars, putting them much higher than all the others. If we look at the north-south perch nodes and all four diagonal perch nodes, they are all roughly the same height as most other nodes. And so when the dragon initiates a perch approach in one of these sections, it's already at roughly the same height, so it just needs to satisfy the one perch node and immediately goes to the center. But when perch approaching an east-west pillar, the dragon must spiral the entire height of the east-west pillar to reach the perch node on top, then slowly descend all the way back down during the perch. This is why most runners like to avoid the east-west perch and opt for north-south as the difference can be upwards of 30 seconds. The perch itself is pretty well known, as most are familiar with the one cycle concept. When perching, the dragon chooses the highest solid block at 0-0 and swings back and forth until it reaches that target block. Most runs end here as beds and respawn anchors can be used to one cycle the dragon right before it actually lands. The typical setup uses one obsidian as a blast resistant block, and timing the explosions takes some practice, but is most optimal when the dragon's head hitbox is seen rotating 180 degrees opposite from its body. The bed explosion is asymmetric because the explosion is centered at the pillow, so one cycling from the side the dragon's head is rotating around is known as the correct side and well-timed beds deal 60 plus damage, while one cycling away from the side the dragon's head is rotating is known as the wrong side, and well-timed beds can deal 45 plus damage. Lastly, one cycling along the dragon's rotation axis is termed front to back, and well-timed beds can deal 50 plus damage. So because of the different base damages, runners tend to one cycle from the right side, but the dragon can sometimes flip its head rotation side and make the one cycle a bit more difficult. Now, if the dragon is still alive as it successfully perches, it becomes immune to arrows and will swivel towards the nearest player and use a dragon's breath attack on the ground in front. If there's a player within 20 blocks of the end fountain, the dragon waits 12 seconds and repeats this swiveling and dragon's breath attack four times total and then unperches going back into a normal phase. If the player is further than 20 blocks, the dragon will instead unperch and briefly charge the player or if the dragon takes 50 or more damage while perched, it will immediately unperch into a normal phase. All right, so now that we know all about the dragon phases, we can finally talk about the two graphs that determine which phase the dragon decides to be in. The first graph determines if the dragon decides to perch, while the second determines if the dragon will decide to strafe. On the first graph, the x-axis shows the number of crystals destroyed, with the y-axis being the dragon's perch chance. The equation is pretty simple, just being 1 over 3 plus the number of end crystals remaining on the end island. So every time the dragon finishes reaching the end of a string of nodes, it makes a decision on whether it will go into perch or normal phase based on this graph. So if we decide to not destroy any end crystals, we would be on the leftmost side of this graph, and the dragon would roll about an 8% chance to perch every time it needs to make this decision. If we decided to destroy every end crystal, the dragon would then have a 33% chance to perch every time, a pretty significant increase. Now one thing to note about this graph is the slope. If we're using a bow and arrow and we take out the first end crystal, our odds go from 7.7% to 8.3% perch chance. Not really much of a difference. But taking out the 10th and last end crystal, our odds would jump from 25% to 33%. So basically, the later crystals destroyed are much more impactful than the first few. Now, if the dragon doesn't decide to perch, it needs a second graph to determine if it will go into strafe or normal phase. The graph looks like this, where the x-axis is now the player's distance away from the end fountain, and the y-axis is the strafe chance. The equation for this graph is much more complicated, so we don't even need to look at it, but the takeaway point is that the further the player is from the fountain, the less likely the dragon is to go into strafe mode. And in general, a lower amount of strafe phase is what we want to accomplish. If the dragon is staying in normal phase more often, it means higher odds of rolling a perch. And so in general, staying away from the center and fountain will lead to less strafes, which in turn leads to more perches. A note on this graph is the distance is pretty impactful. Anywhere from 0 to 20 blocks from the end fountain gives a 50% chance of strafing, whereas if the player was very, very far away from the end fountain, this would give only an 8% chance to strafe. So where the player is standing has a drastic impact on the dragon's behavior. And that's it for part one. That's basically everything to do with the end fight mechanics from a speedrunner's perspective. 
I hope you enjoyed, and I hope this info helps you play your end fights better. And I'll see you in part two, where we'll use the mechanics we learned here to help come up with the fastest end fight strategies for every situation.